And tonight we have a new pick to run the Justice Department, former Florida Attorney General and former Trump lawyer Pam Bondi. This coming just hours after President-elect Trump's first pick, Matt Gates called it quits. Trump saying Bondi will refocus the DOJ to its intended purpose of fighting crime and making America safe again. Again, all this happening in a matter of hours. So what was behind Gates' swift step aside? We know something must have happened behind closed doors between now and yesterday when he visited Capitol Hill to try to get support and seemed to be super confident about how things were going with lawmakers. Take a listen. They've been going great. Uh, Senator's been giving me a lot of good advice. I'm looking forward to a hearing. Uh, folks have been very supportive. They've been saying we're going to get a fair process. So uh, it's a great day of momentum for the Trump Vance administration. So no one is saying exactly what happened next up front, but NBC News is hearing that the five Republican senators that you see here on the screen were reportedly hard nose on his confirmation. Let's bring in NBC's Von Hillier. Von, uh, Pam Bondi, well, why is she the backup plan here, and, and what do we know about her time as Florida's AG? Right. It's really a surprising pick, but one that we could anticipate the likely potential that she'll be confirmed. Because, let's be clear, Pam Bondi, who is Attorney General of Florida from 2011 to 2019, has been a longtime ally of Donald Trump's, was a backer of his in his 2016 presidential run, somebody who, during his first impeachment trial, helped provide him legal counsel and defending him during the impeachment proceeding. And then in the years since, has been on cable, including uh, Fox News and other right-wing outlets, often defending him through his criminal indictments. And clearly Donald Trump sees in Pam Bondi somebody who is faithful and loyal to him. And yet, we should be clear, doesn't carry quite the same bombast as a Matt Gates does, but also uh, doesn't have those serious allegations that Matt Gates was facing against her. And so, you know, based off of some responses up on Capitol Hill so far, there seems like a receptivity to having Pam Bondi come in of course, she has not answered clearly well, how she sees her role in the Department of Justice. Donald Trump wants somebody to go in there and clear out shop and get rid of a lot of those career prosecutors who he says unfairly were uh, targeting him. And so we'll see, uh, based off of her confirmation proceedings, how she answers those questions. And Von Gates is out. He was, uh, to be argued, the most controversial. But Pete Hegseth, Trump's pick for Secretary of Defense, he's also been dealing with sexual misconduct allegations as well, right? So what's the latest with him? Right. The attention kind of turns here to Pete Hegseth, who was actually up on Capitol Hill today meeting with the Republican senators. You can only afford to lose the support of really four Republican senators up on Capitol Hill because he'll need that simple majority of 51 senators to go and defend him. And currently, there are 53 Republican, gov or Republican senators up on Capitol Hill. But uh, last night, overnight, there was a police report from Monterey, California, that was released in which there is an encounter that he had with a woman in October of 2017. He was not criminally charged, but in this report, uh, there are two competing stories, one in which he said that he had a sexual encounter that was consensual with a woman who was referred to as Jane Doe in this report. But this Jane Doe told authorities that she was at this event where, Matt, where uh, Pete Hegseth was at, and that she said that she believed that she had been drugged or medicated and that was led back to his room. And she said that she did not want to engage in a, a sexual encounter, but that Pete Hegseth uh, all but forced her to. And then four days later, she went to a hospital before authorities were contacted about the incident. And so uh, he and his attorney have said that there was no wrongdoing. And ultimately, they settled in a, a civil a civil suit over the, in a civil matter over it, civil settlement, excuse me, over this, in which money was paid to the woman. But he has continued to deny the allegations that were presented by this Jane Doe. At the same time, he is in the position to take over the top spot of the Pentagon as Secretary of Defense. And undoubtedly here, he will face some serious questions up on Capitol Hill from those senators who will be the ones to determine whether he is confirmed. And we're not talking just Democratic senators. We're talking Republican senators, too. So, Vaughn, the big picture here, um, are we starting to see the first signs of limits to Trump's power, even with control of the House and control of the Senate in Republicans' hands? 
Absolutely. Over the last nine years, the Republican Party has really kind of reshaped itself into the image of Donald Trump. But what today indicated by Matt Gates, you know, backing away and pulling out of his confirmation uh, proceedings was out of uh, a concern that there's not enough Republican senators that would support him. And so just because Republicans have the majority in the House and the Senate, it clearly today was an indication that just because Donald Trump wants, whether it be a nominee to be confirmed or potential legislation or a budget to pass, it doesn't necessarily mean that Republicans on Capitol Hill are going to sign on to everything that he wants. And so this is a real indication that there is at least some resistance up on Capitol Hill to the desires of Donald Trump. Bon Hilliard, thank you. Let's turn to NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez, who has more on what went south for Matt Gates. Tonight, President-elect Trump's embattled pick for attorney general is out. Former Florida Congressman Matt Gates rocking Washington by withdrawing his name. Posting on social media, it is clear that my confirmation was unfairly becoming a distraction to the critical work of the Trump-Vance transition. On Capitol Hill, some Democrats rolling their eyes. Holy sh I didn't see that coming. While some Republicans seeming relieved. Are you surprised that Gates dropped out today? I was, I was surprised by how abruptly it happened. Two Trump transition sources with direct knowledge of Gates' decision tell NBC News that he notified the president-elect earlier today and that it was Gates's call. Another source close to Trump says that Gates' withdrawal was welcomed by the transition team, adding that the House ethics report started to leak out and there was no way for Matt to make it. Today, President-elect Trump posting, I greatly appreciate the recent efforts of Matt Gates in seeking approval to be attorney general. He was doing very well, but at the same time did not want to be a distraction for the administration, for which he has much respect. The sudden withdrawal comes just a day after Vice President-elect J.D. Vance accompanied Gates to Capitol Hill, sitting for closed-door meetings with GOP senators. The senator's been giving me a lot of good advice. I'm looking forward to the hearing. Uh, folks have been very supportive. But pressure has been building on Gates for days. How troubling were the allegations against Gates? I think very troubling. A growing number of Republican senators were demanding the release of a House ethics report into allegations he paid women for sex, including a 17-year-old, back in 2017. Just today, a source familiar telling NBC News there was allegedly a second sexual encounter with a 17-year-old that included another woman. Gates has repeatedly denied the accusations, and a Justice Department investigation into similar allegations ended, with prosecutors filing no charges against Gates. Tonight, multiple sources tell NBC News at least five Republican senators were prepared to vote against Gates' confirmation, and he could only afford to lose three GOP votes. Matt Gates. All of this a blow to Trump, who had been looking for someone to shake up the Justice Department, which he blames for launching what he calls partisan prosecutions against him. Just days ago, saying he had no second thoughts about the pick. Are you reconsidering the nomination of Matt Gates? No. Tonight, it's not clear what's next for Gates or his political career. Apparently, he was aware of reality. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. And right now, a dangerous duo of storms is slamming the West Coast with Northern California and Oregon right in the bullseye. Two million people in the area are under flood watches. Some parts of Northern California could see more than a foot of rain, while nearby mountains could see up to five feet of snow. And that snow is already causing problems with cars veering off the road and trucks stuck in standstills. This comes as Washington state is reeling from a massive bomb cyclone that left a trail of damage in its path and power outages that could last days there. The winds were so powerful, they knocked down huge trees, ripping some that were 100 feet tall right out of the ground. Some people even got stuck in their neighborhoods. When I got up this morning and was going to go out to the road, I got up to here and looked left and right and thought, nope, <laughs> we're not going anywhere. A lot of that nasty weather is also hitting the northeast where the rain is much needed after a way too long of a dry spell led to a dangerous wildfire outbreak. We've got team coverage tonight. Bill Karens will have the forecast. But first, let's go to Steve Patterson in Redding, California. And Steve, it looks pretty bad out there. What are conditions expected to be like over the next few hours? Rain, rain, and more rain. More rain than this area has seen in a long time. Over the next 24, 48 hours, even through Saturday, we're supposed to see consistent rain. This atmospheric river has really settled on this region, and so it is going to be nonstop. This has been going all day long. It will go all day long. 
tomorrow, and it has the potential to cause some problems, right? The reason why we're at a river, this is one of the problem spots that people are fearing, that these rivers will swell, that they will spark flash flooding, and that they will flood into communities, snaring traffic and causing problems, of course, in homes and communities, which uh, obviously is something authorities are paying very close attention to and telling people right now, just stay off the roads if you can. Got it? Yeah. And Steve, I'm not sure if you could see, but we we are showing a lot of video of all those trees down. Is California in for the same kind of damage yeah. that Washington has been dealing with? So it, the, the damage patterns are going to be different no matter what happens, right? Because this storm kind of came in two phases. There was the initial bomb cyclone, which came with incredibly high winds, 74 to 80 mile an hour wind gusts. That's what you're seeing. The pattern of damage almost kind of like a, a kind of like a tornado. I mean, obviously different pattern, but same sort of wind force, right? So it's scattered trees, uh, you know, uprooted power lines, caused massive power outages in that area and killed people because those trees landed on cars and trailers and homes. Uh, this will be different because what we are dealing with now exclusively is the rain. The winds have pretty much laid down. This rain is coming down consistently, but it's straight down on top of us. So the problems are going to come with just too much rain, saturated burn scars. As you know, if those things mm -hmm. get too wet, the soil is really loose. It has the ability to cause a rock slide or a mudslide or a washout. And then, of course, these rivers have the potential for that flash flooding. So that is the true worry. The pattern of the damage will be different. It will look a lot different, but it could be even more disastrous here if it settles in and it hits the wrong places. Got it? Yeah, all, all the ingredients for a recipe there are, are right there. Steve Patterson, send in dry, warm thoughts your way, man. Thank you. <laughs> now let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Uh, are we in that window of peak intensity yet with this storm, or is it going to get a lot worse? Overnight, got it. That's the worst of it. I mean, we'll, we'll show you. So first Earth, the East West Coast storm. Here's the big East Coast storm. Let me show you the twin storms that we have on the West Coast. So the bomb cyclone has been spinning out here for three days now. That's kind of weakened significantly. And now this new storm, you can see it really intensifying. This is not going to get quite as strong as the last one, so the winds won't be as high. But this is still going to bring that atmospheric river to the coastal areas here from about San Francisco northwards. And that's where we're really concerned. That's where we have the high risk of flash flooding during the overnight hours. We've already been concentrating right around Santa Rosa, just north of San Francisco. We had consistent, very heavy rain during the day today. Tonight, we're going to watch this inching northwards, and we think it's going to set up somewhere around the Fort Bragg area up here towards Eureka. So this area in here is where we're most concerned with the river levels later tonight. We could get 8 to 12 additional inches in the foothills. I mean, we've already had 6 to 8 inches in some cases, so that's how you're going to get up to 12 to 18 inches of rain. Uh, it's amazing we haven't had more flooding concerns, Gotti, but these are the city totals that we're expecting. You know, Redding, another two and a half inches. But you notice in the mountainous areas, that's five to seven. Snow levels are pretty high with this event. They were a little lower with the last storm a couple days ago. And the northeast, you guys are seeing more than just rain right now, right? Yeah, this was a little more snow than a lot of people were expecting, especially southern Wisconsin. Today had two to four inches of snow widespread. Chicago had two to three inches of snow today during the daylight hours. We've had that coating of snow through Indiana, Louisville, Lexington, and Kentucky. And now we're watching the coastal storm developing just south of New York City. And this has put out all the fires. So the fire danger threat is over with. This has taken a chunk out of the drought, not ending it. New York City now approaching an inch of rain. But you notice the blue on the map. We're getting colder at night now. And now we're we're watching rain changing over to snow and winter storm warnings. The southern tier of New York, northern portions of Pennsylvania, including the Poconos, the Catskills, and also some heavy snow in the high Appalachians, mostly going to be above about, about 1,500 feet. Now, snow totals as much as 6 to 8 inches. I think isolated spots, 10 inches of heavy, wet snow. We're concerned with power outages as we go throughout tomorrow morning in these areas here, maybe even in New Jersey. And I even think New York City is going to see a chance, Gotti, of some snow flakes tonight, but we won't see accumulation. So it's good that that we've gotten this moisture it's just that uh, you know i don't know if people were ready to drive in the snow already we could have you know maybe a rain event first and then deal with the winter yeah. weather no nope, we're going straight into winter bill yes. karens thank you okay
And the International Criminal Court issued arrest warrants today for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his former defense minister for alleged war crimes in Gaza. The ICC is accusing them for a number of human rights abuses in Gaza, where more than 44,000 Palestinians have been killed, according to local officials there. The ICC also issuing a warrant for Hamas military leader Mohammed Diaf, who Israel says they've killed earlier this year. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez has more. Hey there. For the last six months, Israel has been using every legal and political means at its disposal to try to stop this moment from coming. But now it has the International Criminal Court issuing arrest warrants for both Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel's former defense minister, Yoav Gallant, accusing both men of using starvation as a weapon of war in Gaza and, in some cases, of ordering the Israeli military to intentionally target Palestinian civilians. Now, those are allegations Netanyahu is angrily denying tonight. He is accusing the court of being anti anti-Semitic, and he is saying that Israel is being unfairly targeted as a democratic country fighting a war which it did not start. Now, there is little danger of Netanyahu imminently ending up in handcuffs or in the dock and the court in The Hague, but he does now join a lonely club along with Vladimir Putin of world leaders who are wanted for war crimes. And while the U.S. and Israel are not signatories to the International Criminal Court, 124 countries around the world are, including nearly all the Western democracies, the U.S., the U.K., excuse me, the U.K., France, Germany, Canada. And now, in theory, Netanyahu could face arrest if he sets foot in any one of those countries. So his travel likely to be very limited going forward. This is a pretty shocking position for the prime minister of Israel to be in. Six months ago, when the prosecutor of the international court first applied for these warrants, he was also seeking the arrest of three senior Hamas officials, two of them now confirmed to have been killed but the court today issuing an arrest warrant for Mohammed Deef, who is Hamas's military chief, accusing him of war crimes committed on October 7th. Now, Israel says Deef was actually killed several months ago in an Israeli airstrike. And so this is effectively an empty gesture by the International Criminal Court. The White House says it fundamentally rejects the court's decision to go after Israel's leaders and President-elect Trump's incoming national security advisor says the court can expect the Trump administration to take action once it enters office in January. I'll send it back to you. Raf Sanchez, thank you. And tonight, a Russian airstrike on Ukraine so dramatic that Ukrainian authorities immediately called it an attack by an intercontinental ballistic missile, which rains warheads down from space. Now, take a look at this security video caught near the attack. It shows these massive streaks plummeting from the sky and striking targets below. But Russia says this was not an ICBM. They are saying it's actually a new experimental weapon and a response to the Ukrainian hitting targets in Russia earlier this week with U.S. and British-made weapons. NBC News chief international correspondent Keir Simmons has the latest. Well, tonight, President Putin has appeared on Russian television and said that Russia has launched a new kind of missile at Ukraine, a medium-range ballistic missile capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. It's the first time that this kind of rocket has been fired at Ukraine. It was not uh, carrying a, a nuclear warhead, but clearly uh, Russia wants to send a message. Uh, President Putin saying on Russian television that this is a response to the Biden administration sanctioning the use of long-range weapons by Ukraine against Russia. Also uh, this week, uh, Washington agreed for Ukraine uh, to use uh, landmines. It is another escalation in a conflict that has been escalating in recent days, uh, partly because all sides are preparing for when the new Trump administration arrives and the fact that uh, President-elect Trump says that he will demand that both sides uh, do a deal. There are tens of thousands of Russian troops backed by North Korean troops along the front line in the Kursk region of Russia, which, of course, uh, Ukraine took 
in the summer. We're waiting for that offensive to start to make some progress. But, but Russia has been making progress in many other places. And the Biden administration clearly determined to support Ukraine to hold the line ahead of the inauguration. Keir Simmons, thank you. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, Google in the crosshairs of the DOJ. Why the feds want the tech giant to sell off Chrome and what it means for the future of how you search online. Plus, jean Benet Ramsey's family is still hoping for answers. Why her father thinks the killer will be found as we start to approach the 28-year anniversary since that mystery began. And later this hour, a hot topic as we head into the holiday travel season, lost luggage. How Apple is teaming up with airlines to make that potential nightmare a lot less of a hassle. That's coming up in tonight's Future of Everything. Hey, welcome back, and here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. A group of passengers banded together to duct tape a man after he tried opening a door of a plane mid-flight. Apparently, the guy called himself the captain, tried to open the door, and knocked out a flight attendant. That's when some passengers took him down and taped him up until the plane safely landed. The investigation there is still ongoing. And a Wisconsin father who police thought might have drowned is actually alive, possibly in Uzbekistan, according to authorities. Ryan Boghord was reported missing after he went kayaking back in August, but now police say he's in good condition after they had a video call with him. Officials say they have not issued any warrants for his arrest. And moments ago, Alabama carried out its third execution by nitrogen gas. 50-year-old Carrie Dale Grayson was sentenced to death for the 1994 murder of a hitchhiker. Kenny Smith and Alan Eugene Miller were the first two people to die by nitrogen hypoxia in that state. And in Georgia, the dad of accused Appalachia High School shooter pleaded not guilty in court this morning to 29 charges. His son, Colt Gray, is facing felony murder. The mass shooting that killed four people took place back in September, and police say Colin Gray brought, uh, bought his son an AR-15 as a gift. And the University of Texas is expanding its free tuition program. Undergrad students whose families make a hundred grand or less can attend that school for free starting next fall. UT joins the ranks of schools like MIT, who just announced something similar, but with a $200,000 threshold. And two Palm Beach County Sheriff's deputies have died, and one is fighting for his life after they were hit by an SUV Thursday on Southern Boulevard. Take a look at this. This is the scene of the crash. It's just horrific, and it involved three officers of motorcycles and that SUV. And just hours later, there was a powerful show of unity as hundreds of police officers held an emotional procession for two of the officers that were killed. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas, who has more details tonight from West Palm Beach, Florida. Guad, three motorcycles involved. How, how did that happen? Hey, Gotti, according to local officials, they were conducting traffic stops on the highway. Now, the information we received from the sheriff today was that one of the officers uh, wasn't able to start his motorcycle after one of these traffic stops and called the other two officers to try uh, to help him start the motorcycle. Now, all three of them were unable uh, to start that motorcycle, so they stepped to the side of the highway onto the grass area that's adjacent uh, to the pavement and called for help. As they were waiting for another officer to come help them, uh, this is when uh, the person in a vehicle who was going eastbound on the highway struck them. This is the sheriff talking about what happened. A vehicle driven by a female. She was in the center lane and obviously came upon a vehicle that was going much slower than she was and took action to veer to the right she overcompensated, got off the road, and then struck all three of the motor officers, at which time all three went airborne uh, in different directions. And Gotti, according to the sheriff, the officer that was on his way to help them with the bike, with the motorcycle, uh, saw the accident happen and immediately attended to them. Uh, all three officers were airlifted to this hospital in West Palm Beach. Uh, two of them were pronounced dead here, and the third one remains in critical condition, Gotti. Is the driver of that SUV going to face any charges here? So what we know, Gotti, it was a female driver. Uh, the sheriff said that they believe she was the only person in that vehicle. She sustained minor injuries, uh, but the investigation is being conducted by the state police. 
So uh, local authorities, as of today, during the press conference, said they believed that she was not impaired while she was driving and that she, uh, to their knowledge, she was not facing any criminal charges as of now. But this uh, investigation is still being conducted by the state police, Gotti. Mm -hmm. Such a horrible accident. Guad Venegas, thank you. And remember Jesse Smollett, the actor who was convicted of falsely reporting a hate crime, claiming he was attacked in Chicago in 2019 because he's black and gay? Well, today, the Illinois Supreme Court overturned his conviction. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we got a note. They are not saying they are overturning the facts of this case. That decision came down to one thing. His second trial should not have happened because he already had some sort of a deal with state prosecutors. Now, this case has been a whirlwind over the past five years, especially after police dropped the bombshell claim that he paid two brothers to help him stage the attack, leading to his arrest and conviction. Police say they're now seeking potential persons of interest in the alleged attack on actor Jesse Smollett. The actor arrested today after police say he sought publicity by reporting a fake hate crime. The case now going to the jury after both sides presented their closing arguments today. The jury has reached a verdict, and it is, at least for most of the counts, guilty. Now, Smollett was found guilty on five counts of felony disorderly conduct and sentenced to 150 days in jail, although he only served six days before being released on appeal. And through all of this, he has maintained that he is innocent. NBC's Adrian Broaddus joins us now. Adrian, so if this is not about the facts of the case, what technicality are we talking about here? You know what, Gotti, let's take a step back. This was a unanimous decision, keep in mind, with no dissent, and it focused on Jesse Smollett's due process rights. As you mentioned, he had already met the requirements of his agreement with prosecutors. This case dates back to 2019, when Smollett told police two men attacked him here in Chicago on one of the coldest nights that year, yelling racist and homophobic slurs. But then police continued their investigation, and they arrested the Osendario brothers, who told police Smollett paid them to stage the attack. Now, after that nugget was revealed, the Cook County State's attorney charged Smollett for 16 counts, including filing a false police report and disorderly conduct. Now, then the state's attorney's office dropped the charges with a non-prosecution agreement. Smollett made a deal to forfeit his bond and complete community service. Kim Fox, who leads that office, was she recused herself, but she was criticized, you may remember, at the time. And she says what happened next was wrong. Hear from her now. What happened afterwards should be examined for years to come, should be put into law books. We didn't have to spend this much time, money, and effort on this case. And I'm disappointed that it has taken this long to get to the same result. And she is talking about the appointment of the special prosecutor, Dan Webb, there, who re-indicted Smollett. We had a trial which eventually led to his conviction, which today, Gotti was overturned. It, it, the conviction was overturned, and I hate to ask the, the obvious question here, but what does this ruling say about Smollett's innocence? You know what? His, this ruling does not declare him innocent. And I want to be clear, his defense attorney, as well as Justice Smollett, still maintain his innocent. But that is the question everyone's asking. And I asked his lead defense attorney about what this all means in regards to his innocence today. Here's what he told me. To say, OK, this is a 32-page <laughs> opinion, but nowhere in the opinion do they say Justice Smollett was not guilty of that alleged crime. I think we shouldn't take our, our eyes off the main focus of the court. The court said that the process was unfair. I think any human being with this rational knows that if a process is unfair, anything begotten from that process naturally shouldn't be taken seriously. And we did receive a statement from the special prosecutor, which I want to read to you. It says, in part, the Illinois Supreme Court did not find any error with the overwhelming evidence presented at trial that Mr. Smollett hmm. orchestrated a fake hate crime and reported it to the Chicago Police Department as a real hate crime or the jury's unanimous verdict that Mr. Smollett was guilty. And that was from the special prosecutor, Dan Webb. As far as criminal charges... 
they can't bring this case against Smollett again. Many may be wondering if there's anything, any type of movement that will happen civilly. Um, on the civil side, perhaps, you may remember the city of Chicago did file a civil lawsuit hoping to recoup some of the taxpayer dollars that it spent investigating this case. It remains to be seen if the city will move forward with that. Gotti? Yeah, sometimes a contradiction, I guess, is a conclusion. Adrian Broaddus breaking it all down for us tonight. Adrian, thank you. All right, quick question. Do you ever use Mozilla, Firefox, or, or Internet Explorer? Or do you use Google and Chrome? Because if you're the first ones, this next story might be a shocker. But if you're Googling everything, this is not going to come as a surprise. The Justice Department is trying to break up Google, saying it has a search monopoly. Late yesterday, it asked a federal court to force Google into selling Chrome. And on top of selling Chrome, the DOJ wants Google to sell Android, too, or at least make it so that Google services aren't mandatory on Androids. NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinandella joins us now, thankfully. Okay, here's the question I've got for you, Angela. Uh, sell Chrome, but keep the browser? What's this supposed to do to searching? Okay, so the issue with that the DOJ and also this federal judge who ruled that Google was in violation of antitrust laws is not with Google search itself. It's not with the engine. It's with all of the distribution channels, like the support network that Google has developed over the years that the DOJ argued were limiting competition, were basically mm. crippling everybody else around any potential competitor and not letting them enter the marketplace. So what this federal judge ruled in August was that the monopoly is limited to two areas. First, search user services, and second, search text advertising services. But then because Google controls this entire ecosystem of ad dollars, then attracting more users, then going back to ads, that as a result, other people couldn't enter this marketplace. So with Chrome in particular, with the browser, they are saying that Chrome really creates this problem because so many people use Chrome that it also collects all this user data that's then... Mm -hmm targeted back to search services. So as a result, they are one of the distribution channels that prevent other companies from entering the marketplace. That, that makes a lot of sense, Sarah. So it, it, it seems like Google, though, they're not holding back at all in some of the language they are using to fight this, right? So, so what is their stance? And have you seen this type of like tech aggression before? Yeah, well, look, the DOJ certainly has a... Uh, an intention here to go after big tech and to reduce and break up monopolies across the board. Now, in terms of Google, though, they have two different arguments because, look, this ruling is still being appealed, let alone the remedy. So right now, asking Google to sell off Chrome or to divest in some way, that is a remedy to the ruling. So all of this will likely be appealed, or that's the remedy that the DOJ is requesting. It hasn't even been approved by the judge yet. Now, overall, Google just says we are so dominant because our product is the most superior. It has nothing to do with our violation of antitrust laws. We are just that good. So that's like their baseline argument. But in addition, in, with specific regards to Chrome, they are saying, do you know how much user data Chrome has, which is kind of terrifying? And they're saying, hmm. if you tell us that we have to give this up and sell this to somebody else, somebody else will then be in control of all of our user data. So these arguments are both terrifying, but also interesting, Gotti. <laughs> Terrifying is the right word. Angela Sinandella, thanks so much for joining us. And coming up, giving a gift to Holocaust survivors, the organization helping those amazing people here and live a full life. But first, you got to see this. A man in China had a very close call with a Siberian tiger outside of his home. Now, this was caught on CCTV, and the tiger seems to come out of nowhere throws its body against those iron gates before both the tiger and the man uh, just take off. But in the, another man in that same village was not so lucky. A Siberian tiger actually bit his hand, which was recovered after major surgery. Authorities say it's unclear whether that's the same tiger. Either way, stay alert out there. We'll be right back. And if you were thinking of buying an electric vehicle, you might want to get on top of that because the EV tax credit could be a thing of the past. It was signed into law by President Biden, but it's on Trump's agenda to repeal once he takes office. CNBC's Phil LeBeau has that story. With the expectation the incoming Trump administration will cut or eliminate federal EV tax incentives, it has some asking, how much will EV sales slow down here in California? 
So far this year, one out of every five vehicles sold in this state is electric, just ahead of hybrid sales, which are picking up momentum. Not surprisingly, the Tesla Model Y is the best-selling vehicle in California. It's been popular here since its introduction. That is one reason why California is the number one market for EV sales in the United States. What happens if the Trump administration cuts or eliminates the $7,500 federal incentive for buying an electric car? Well, many believe California may increase its own incentives in order to spur EV adoption. And automakers will continue targeting this state for green vehicle sales. Here at the L.A. Auto Show, Hyundai has unveiled the Ionic 9, a full-size electric SUV. The new Hyundai Ionic 9 will go on sale in the second quarter of next year. By the way, Hyundai is number two in EV sales here in the U.S. with almost 10 percent market share. Phil LeBeau, CNBC Business News, Los Angeles. Phil, thank you. And a new docuseries is bringing attention back to one of the most notorious murder mysteries in American history. What happened to John Bonet Ramsey? Now her father is speaking out on the murder of his little girl as he continues to hope that her killer will be caught. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has more in tonight's cold case files. We want to keep the case alive and in, in front of people. Nearly three decades after the body of his six-year-old daughter was found in the basement of the family's Colorado home, John Ramsey, the father of murdered John Binet, tells today's Savannah Guthrie he believes her killer will be brought to justice. You still have hope that this can be solved? I believe it can be solved if the police accept help from outside this, their system. Uh, that's been the flaw for 25 years. The murder mystery that first captivated the nation 28 years ago and the conspiracy theories that have haunted the family ever since. I was told by someone inside the system to get this message to you. They believe you killed your daughter. Are now the focus of a three-part Netflix docuseries, which raises new questions about the investigation. Some people don't think it's ever going to be solved. Tonight, the Ramsey family tells NBC News they want the Boulder police to bring in outside experts to test key evidence using new technology. In a statement, the Boulder police says it's committed to following up on every lead and continues to work with DNA experts and law enforcement partners until this case is solved. Today, finding the killer is not going to change my life. Um, I've lost JonBenet. It's not going to bring JonBenet back. I would like to close this chapter. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News. Aaron, thank you. And much more to come tonight, including the future of everything, why the tiny device you're probably already using could be the end of a major headache, the partnership that could change the future of travel. It's coming up next. Stay tuned. And in tonight's Future of Everything, we are going down under. Australia's parliament is considering a ban on social media for kids under 16. Now, if this passes, it would be a first of its kind. But how would it even work? Janice Mackey Freyer has the details. If this becomes law in Australia, platforms like TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat, X, Instagram, they could all face tens of millions of dollars in fines if they're found to be allowing kids to hold accounts. It's unprecedented, and a lot of countries will be watching the outcome. Whether this imposed ban and threat of big penalties can actually create safer online spaces for kids. Here in China, they crack down on the online video game industry and put limits on the hours and time of day that kids under 16 could play. And they told companies to make devices equipped with a minor's mode. But this ban goes so much further. The bill has wide political support in Australia. And if it becomes law, platforms have a year to figure out how to implement the age restriction. Why are they doing it? For every reason any parent would want them to. Online safety to protect young people and kids from harmful content about drugs, self-harm, violence, eating disorders. It's not a blanket ban. It won't apply to messaging services or game platforms or education apps. It's to prevent young teens and children from being exposed to streams of content that are unfiltered and infinite. Now, some digital advocacy groups are arguing that a ban doesn't push companies to make sites any safer. And in turn, it might encourage young people to seek out darker and less safe online spaces. But the communications minister in Australia who tabled the proposed law put it this way, that it's meant to set, quote, a new normative value in society 
that accessing social media is not the defining feature of growing up. Hmm. We'll see how that plays out. Janice Mackey Frayer, thank you. And now to the future of travel. You know, you know how you share your location with your family? Well, what if you could do that with airlines and your luggage? On the heels of another busy holiday travel season, Apple is actually starting to team up with some airlines to track your bags with air tags using this new iOS feature called Share Item Location. Folks will be able to share their location of lost luggage with airlines in hopes of speeding up the return process. Apple says more than a dozen airlines, including Delta, United, they're already on board. Managing editor for The Points Guy, Clint Henderson, is here to break this down for us. Clint, thanks for being with us. Walk us through how this is all going to work. I, I lose my luggage. I've got an air tag on it. Do I just text them the live location? W what are we talking here? Yeah, so essentially, Apple will allow you to share a link to an interactive map, and that map will show exactly where your bag is. If it's in the airport, if it's leaving the airport because someone stole it, uh, at least you can sh sort of share that information with the airline. Uh, now, it's not rolling out to every single airline right away. It will be a slow rollout, but there's 15 that are already signed up for it, including some of the big ones. You mentioned Delta, United, uh, British Airways, and their various airline partners. So it should be interesting. I can't wait to test this out when it ro actually rolls out. Uh, looks like towards the end, end of this year and early next year. I, I'm just visualizing like a like a flight, you know, somebody on the flight line, like holding up an iPad, trying to do find my my air tag and making those beeps. And, you know, it's somewhere on the tarmac or or in the airport. Are, are there any big privacy concerns here? So there is. Um, I think Apple's really concerned about this. In fact, there's rumors that there's going to be a new version of the AirTag next year sometime that will have more privacy features. But in the meantime, this tracking service is end to end encrypted. And so Apple promises that no one's going to be able to see it, not even people at Apple. You're only going to be able to share it with your personal contacts or with the airline in this case. Uh, and then eventually maybe uh, a software company that does baggage tracking for all all the airlines. So it'll be mm -hmm. interesting to see how this rolls out. But I think privacy is is front of mind uh, for Apple uh, on, on, the, on this front. I, and I know we're heading into a pretty busy weekend here, next weekend and the week beyond. Uh, and somebody's going to lose their bag, and then they're going to think about this, and they're going to be like, why didn't we already have this? What, what is the timeline here? Yeah, so I think uh, mid-2025, this should be fully rolled out to at least the first 15 airline partners. Uh, but look, I think almost immediately, once the software gets updated, you're going to be able to start sharing this information with friends and family, so your contact list, people that you're very close to, uh, so they can help you potentially look, look for your <laughs> lost baggage or whatever it is. Uh, but the interesting thing is sometimes the issue is you can see where your bag is, but the air you can't get an airline worker to help you. So maybe mm -hmm. this will light a fire under the airline workers to <laughs> actually go and, and find it once this is fully rolled out. And, you know, <laughs> I think this is a great Christmas gift. I'm a, a new believer at AirTags. I really, it's so easy to use the technology and you might as well use it, especially, which I don't do very often if you're checking bags. Yeah, I have so many air tags. I, I've I've lost them, lost track of them, which defeats the entire purpose. But yeah, incredible product. Clinton Henderson, thank you so much for your tips tonight. Yeah, safe travels. All right. Next, we bring you the story of a 102 year old Holocaust survivor facing hearing loss. And he's one of hundreds of survivors in Brooklyn facing that same problem. So our Valerie Castro has a story on how a nonprofit organization is making a difference in a very special delivery. Holocaust survivor Alfred Locke has been alive for more than a century, and with age has come hearing loss. I think you have to clean my ears. But on this day in Brooklyn, New York, about 100 Holocaust survivors like him are getting a gift. Now we're going to get you some hearing aids, okay? <laughs> are you excited? It will be highly appreciated. Oh, good, you're excited. All thanks to the Miracle Ear Foundation, a nonprofit providing free hearing aids. How do I sound? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. After a short consultation and hearing test. Whenever you hear the beep, just press the button for me, okay? Yes. The new devices are delivered on the spot. The gold piece is going to face you. You can slide it over your ear. Uh-huh. Learning to put them in takes a little practice and some fine tuning. Slide it up over your ear. See the button? It's like yeah. a TV remote. Yeah. But it also means hearing a special song. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. 
Alfred turned 102 years old this month, and he's one of 10,000 aging Holocaust survivors who call Brooklyn home. Holocaust survivors tend to live seven years longer than their counterparts. You can call it the survivor gene, um, the resilience gene, and these are the years. We're in the twilight years of their survival. Alfred survived the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Germany, remembering when Hitler arrived in his native Austria. Went to school, to a Jewish school in Vienna, but in 1938, when Hitler came, it was impossible, impossible to leave. After living through that trauma, improving quality of life in his golden years is what this day is all about. I would say a significant portion of them are financially needy. So when coming to a person and saying to them, for free, we can give you something that will enhance your daily life experience, increase your dignity, and hopefully increase the level of joy in your life, it's tremendous. For Alfred, his enhanced ability to hear means more phone calls with his grandchildren. Hello, Rivka. Yes, yeah, speak, speak. How are you? Okay, okay. How are you? Speak slow, slow, slow. Valerie Castro. Okay, I love you too. NBC News. Bye bye. Oh my gosh, how about that, Valerie Castro? Thank you. Before we go, it is time for the best of us. His dad gave up his prized car to help support a newborn. Now, 40 years later, guess what's coming back home? That's coming up next. And finally tonight. 41 years ago, a Texas dad sold his dream car, this beautiful blue Chevy Camaro, just so he could pay for his diapers for his newborn baby boy. Well, now his son is repaying that favor, and Ali Spilliards from NBC's Dallas affiliate has their story in tonight's Best of Us. Here we go. Earl Blinds was 22 years old when he bought his dream car, a 1967 Chevrolet Camaro. It was blue with uh, white stripes. But when his son Jared was born... Here's a picture of me and Jared. He didn't think twice about selling his beloved car to pay for diapers. I used to tease Jared quite a bit. You know, I used to have a, I used to have a car like that one over there. You know, you, you needed diapers, and so that was, that's what happened to that car. I thought he was full of it. Like, mm -hmm, I used to have a Camaro. It's like the guy at the, at the bar talking about the high school championship from 20 years ago or something. For more than 40 years, that Camaro was part of the family's fabric of stories, which Jared heard time and time again. It's a 1967 Marina Blue Camaro SS with a 350 small block V8, an automatic three-speed transmission. Jared knew his dad loved that car, and so he set out to find it. I wanted to begin the quest to get my dad's car back. It took years to find a similar model and fix it up. But this year, on his dad's 65th birthday, Jared shared his surprise, decades in the making. That is not just a 67 Camaro. Right? That is your 67 Camaro. <laughs> that is your car. Thanks for the diaper money, Dad. <laughs> it was a moment that brought Earl to tears. After getting reacquainted, Earl will tell you this 67 Camaro isn't exactly like the car he gave up. It's better. Wanting Dad to really understand how much I love him and how important he is to me. I'm like, what is the greatest thing possible? And it's the Camaro. It was always going to be the Camaro. For NBC News, Ali Spilliards, Mesquite, Texas. Thanks for the diaper money, Dad. I'm not crying. You are crying. That's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.